Good morning, church. Yes, it's wonderful to be back with you all this morning. Uh, and, but before we go on to the sermon, I just want to uh, thank all of those who have been supporting, uh, have registered to the Little Lambs uh, ministry that we were promoting the last few Sundays. Today is the last Sunday that we'll have the table outside to collect forms. After this Sunday, those of you who still have the burden, you can do so directly. All right? But after this Sunday, we, as a church, we won't help you to collect forms and send it down anymore. All right? So that after this, it's between you and uh, the NGO directly. All right? Another thing just to, hide, just to let you all know, for the next coming few months, I will be away quite a number of weeks. And the reason is because as a district superintendent, DS for the central district, I need to visit all my other churches. And there are about eight churches in our districts. So that's, that means eight Sundays. Lah. So I've been doing that the last few weeks, the last month. And for the coming months, there'll be a few more weeks that I have to just go around and pay my visits to the district churches. So you won't be seeing me in church for a couple of weeks uh, every month. Alright, and so now take out your sermon notes as we go into the uh, Word. But before that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God, Lord, we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And Lord, this morning, once again, we ask for your Spirit to come and just open our hearts, Lord. Open our hearts to hear from you what you want to say to us about our lives today. We just commit this time unto your hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Today, we want to look at a life of another character in the Bible. And that character is Judah. Now, I know most of you may not know the person Judah. We always hear the name Judah. We hear Jesus as the Lion of Judah and all things about Judah, but we don't really know who Judah is. All right, so this morning we want to look at Judah. And Judah is basically the son of, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Jacob had 12 sons. Judah was one of those 12 sons, all right? And so Judah was a scoundrel. All right, if you look, the Bible starts off with Judah as a real scoundrel. You know the story about Joseph, right? Jacob had 12 sons. The, the, the younger son, Joseph, the father loved Joseph so much and the brother all ganged up and killed Joseph. Correct? You know the story, right? They ganged up, beat him up. Okay, they didn't kill him. Lah. They wanted to kill him. But in fact, actually, the brothers wanted to kill him. But Judah was the guy with the smart, the smart aleck there, the big scoundrel. He said, hey, hey, wait, wait, wait. We beat him up already. We kill him. No value leh. Let's make some money out of him. Go back to Genesis 37. Let me read to you. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him off to the Ishmaelites. Alright, so the guy with the smart idea to sell Joseph off to become a slave was Judah. Judah was the big scoundrel. And not only that, when the father was mourning, when they came back and tell the father, oh, your, your son got eaten by wolves or dogs or cats or whatever, was eaten up. Then the father was crying there, was mourning for years. You know what Judah did? Judah went and party. He went away from the father, went traveling, went having party and enjoying his life. And when he was partying, he got married. He got married to a Canaanite woman, someone who was not, that God said don't get married to. He got married to the Canaanite woman and became, and he uh, visited prostitutes. He did all sorts of uh, things. But at the end of the book of Genesis, when you come to the end of the book of Genesis, something different happened. You see, Judah Joseph had, I mean, Jacob had 12 sons, right? Joseph died, or, or missing lah, and they were, he had a younger son named Benjamin. And at first, last time, he used to love Joseph, the most the favourite son. But after Joseph disappeared, he now loved Benjamin as the favourite son. And something happened at the end of the book of Genesis, that when Benjamin's life was threatened, when Benjamin's life was at risk, Judah the brother who was willing to sell off his other brother, the one who couldn't care less was partying, actually stood up to defend that younger brother now, Benjamin. And not only stood up to defend, he actually offered his life in exchange for this young brother, Benjamin. And at the end of Jacob's life, the father's life, when he called all the 12 sons together, okay, you know, some of them are scoundrels, right? And many of them are still scoundrels. When he called all of them together, and when Jacob blessed all the children, listen, most, most of the blessings were not blessing actually, it's more like curses. You're going to be this terrible fella, la. this is going to happen to your house, la. this is going to be to you. But when he blessed Judah, look what he says in Genesis 49. He said, when Jacob blessed Judah, he said, Judah, 
You are he whom your brothers shall praise. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. You know, in, in fact, what happens is this. Judah became the inheritor of the Abrahamic covenant. The whole promise that God gave to Abraham that you'll be the, this, the father of many nations, that your, that your stars, you know, will never, you'll be a descendant as the stars and all that, and salvation will come through the Abrahamic covenant. That covenant was inherited by Judah. And that's why the Israel that you know of, when Jesus came on the scene 2,000 years you know, later, I mean 2,000 years ago when Jesus came on the scene, there was no Israel left. All the other 11 brothers are dead. No tribes, no nation, nothing. The Israel that Jesus came on the scene to was the nation of Judah. The descendants of Judah. No other 11 brothers gone, wiped out, no more. Only left Judah. And Judah is what we call, Jesus, the God is the lion of Judah. How did Judah be, became from such a scoundrel, became the inheritor of Abrahamic's promise? In fact, you look at the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, it says this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. The brothers are not even mentioned, just Judah. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Paris begot Hezron. Remember these names, Judah, Tema, and Perez. What happened? What changed Judah from such a scoundrel to be the inheritor of God's promise? What was the decisive factor? Something happened in between. And I believe when you look at the book of at the life of Judah, it all happened in Genesis chapter 38, the passage that was just read by our dear sister. You see, Judah left home, he was partying, he got married, he got three sons, and he got a wife for the eldest son. And the wife's name was Tama. And, 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 when the, and somehow the eldest son was the biggest scoundrel than the father, so God said, okay, poop, die, the end. Then, according to the custom of that day, or the law of those days, is basically this. When the elder brother passed away, the elder brother needs to have an heir needs to have a son, but the but that died before having a son, the next brother in line is to marry the wife of the elder brother so that he can have a son. All right, and that's the tradition, that is the custom, that is the law. But when the second brother came on the scene, married this wife, he doesn't want to give the older brother a son. So God said, okay, punish you also, poop, die. Now Judah is in trouble, he's panicked. I only got three sons. Two already killed by this, this woman. This woman, this scoundrel woman, this evil woman married my son, killed two sons already. I want to give my third one to him, to her. Ayo, cham lo. So what he do? He said, okay, never mind. You go back to your father's house. You be a widow there for a while. My son's still young. When he grow up, then I let him marry you. But that was not his intention. He just wanted to keep her, hair, keep her in the father's house, away from sight, away from mind, and hopefully she grow old and die there. That was his plan. All right? But then something happened. Tama is a smart lady. She won't stay at home. Years pass and then she knows, okay, this father-in-law is a scoundrel. He just tricked me. She just scammed me. And so what did she do? She scammed the scammer. She went and tricked the trickster. All right? And so she did her do. She took matters in her own hand, tricked the father-in-law, have a child with the father-in-law. Because like, you, your sons don't want to pay their dues. You as a father, you pay your dues. So he got the son from the father-in-law, took as proof the signal cord and the and the row, uh, the, 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 the the something like the belt, the seal and the staff took all those as collateral, as proof, and he disappeared. When the father found when Judah found out she was pregnant, Judah said, Okay, now is my chance to get rid of this woman, this wretched woman. Pregnant ma, widow, how can you get pregnant, right? So widow got pregnant, send the police, catch her, stone her to death. And suddenly he was face to face with what had happened. He saw the signet cord. He saw the staff. And this is what happened. He said, Listen carefully. Genesis 38. I believe this was the turning point of Judah's life. 38 verse 26, it says, So Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I because I did not give her to Shelah, my son. At that point, when Judah was confronted with his sins, he acknowledged them. He acknowledged them. And I believe that was the turning point of him. I mean, don't forget, no, Judah was a, a, a trickster. He was a swindler. He can swindle his way out. He's a smart guy. He can plot and conspire and swindle his way out. But he didn't. He stopped. 
he paused and he acknowledged them. God knew that Judah was evil. He knew that Judah was a scoundrel. But God also knew that Judah was correctable. Judah was one person who was correctable. He had a, what I call a high correctability factor. You know, some of us, we, don't have, we are not correctable. We have a very low correctability factor. But Judah had a high correctability factor. In fact, you can write the first point of your note is this. A correctable heart will always result in confession and repentance. A correctable heart will always result in confession and repentance. You know, and all we need a correctable heart. And like Judah said, you know, Judah, let's look again. Genesis 26, 38, 26. Judah acknowledged them and said, she had been more righteous than I because I did not give to her, to her Shela, my son. He acknowledged he confessed, and the Bible says he never knew her again. He repented. He would never have done Tasha again. He repented. Judah knew, and he repented. He has restored Tamar as his daughter-in-law, restored her rights, restored her as part of the family. He, re- he confessed, and he repented. You know, sometimes for us, uh, we, we Christians, we human beings, lah. we are good at admitting our wrong, but not good at repenting. You know, it's like my wife, you know, sometimes we will argue, 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 debate, debate, debate. In the end, say, okay, la, I admit I'm wrong, but I'm not repentant. Sometimes we are like that. You know, we can admit we are wrong, but are we willing to repent? And a high correctable, uh, correctable heart is one that is willing to confess and repent. And it's so important for us to have a correctable heart. You know why? Because sin never separates us from God. Sin is not what that separates us from God. It is unrepentant sin that separates us from God. Sin alone will never separate God. You know why? Because Christ died on the cross for our sins. Christ died so that sin can be dealt with. But it's only when sin, when we have unrepentant sin, that separates us from God. It's never sin alone. All of us will sin. Every one of us, in fact, every hour, every minute, every day, we sin. We sin in our thoughts, we sin in our hearts, we sin in our words, we sin. But sin doesn't separate us. It is when we are unrepentant of our sins, we separate us from God. And so it goes back to that, how correctable are you? And that's why it's so important to have a correctable heart because we need our hearts to be correctable because we keep sinning. And if we don't have a heart that is correctable and we keep sinning, It draws us away from God because there's nothing to correct us back to God. There's nothing to correct us back to the cross. And so this okay. So so how correctable are you? Well, would you write the first I'm gonna give four signs or four symptoms of an uncorrectable heart. A heart that is not correctable. A person with a very low correctability factor. Let me give you four signs or four symptoms. Number one is a person if a sign of an uncorrectable heart is anger and defensiveness. Anger and defensiveness. You see, Judah could have reacted in anger. He could say, how dare this wretched woman trick me? How dare this little girl think she can outswindle me? You know? Or you can say, hey, I didn't know that. I'm, I'm innocent. Well, she tricked me. Man. Not my fault. Well. Correct, right? Not my fault. Right? She tricked me, right? She's the one that's guilty. Judah could have defended. He could have burst out in anger. He could have done all that. And some of us, we are like that, aren't we? Maybe not in all things. In many things in our life, when people, when it's pointed out to us, we are okay. But in that area which we are uncorrectable, in those areas in our lives that we refuse to be correctable, we get angry. We get defensive. Whatever you say, you say other things in my life, I'm okay. But when you hit that part of my life where I'm uncorrectable, all the anger comes out. All the defensiveness comes out. Everything just bursts out. That's why Proverbs 9 says this, Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. In other words, what separates a scoffer, a wise and an unwise person, is how well you take instructions. Is how well you are, how correctable you are. The first sign, anger and defensiveness. 
The second sign of an uncorrectable heart is blame transfer. Blame transfer. We like to transfer blame. You know, it's like a story of this little girl, you know. One day the father was downstairs and then suddenly he heard the, the little boy cry. The boy was maybe about two-year-old boy. He was crying upstairs. So he ran upstairs and see the little two-year-old boy was crying and the sister who was about six years old was standing next to the brother. So the father asked, what happened to the little brother? What happened? Why is he crying? Oh, my brother hit his head. How he hit his head on what? He hit his head on the baseball bat. Where was the baseball bat? In my hands. You try to transfer the blame. Judah could have done that. Judah could have blamed Tama. She seduced me. You know, she walked around that way, the way she sway her body, the way she stand there and blink at me. She seduced me. I was weak. My wife just died, Ma. And then here come along this pretty little thing. Not my fault. It was her. She was the one. She's the sinner. Then we still do that. In fact, we have been doing that all the way from the book of Genesis, from chapter 1, I mean, beginning of Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned. What did Adam do? Adam blame? Blame who? Blame Eve. And Eve blame who? So who's the smarter one? <laughs> we do that. Cain and Abel, Cain, they blame, they're blaming each other. Every time, whenever you come to a person who is uncorrectable, we are always blaming. When something points at us, the area of our life that we need to be corrected, we will blame others. The blame will go. He made me angry. He said this. He insulted me. He did this. He didn't do that. He didn't do this. She didn't did that, do that. We blame. We push it around. If he didn't do this, I wouldn't react that way. And so it's her fault. We blame. The first is anger. The second is blame. The third, the third sign is denial. Denial. I mean, Judah could have done that, right? Eh? I don't know whose one is this, leh? This staff, ah? Don't know, lah. Tapena tingok, eh? Or maybe it looked like my staff. It sounds like my staff, but it's not my staff. He could have said that. Denial. Judah could have done that. He could have just denied the whole thing ever happened. And to be honest, in those society in that day, who's going to believe? The rich sheep herder father or the prostitute woman widower? Who will believe? Judah would, no, nobody would doubt Judah. He would go away scot-free. He could have just denied the whole thing. But you know, this is one of the worst forms of an uncorrectable heart, the worst symptom. You know why? Because when we, when we go into denial, we basically refuse to acknowledge there is a problem. We completely stop the work of the Holy Spirit. At least when we are angry, when we lose out in temper, the Holy Spirit can still convict us because you are angry. When we try to blame other people, the Holy Spirit can still show us the error of our blaming. But when we are in complete denial, nothing wrong with me, we completely stop the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We pull the brakes, poop. There's nothing the Holy Spirit can do anymore because we just refuse to acknowledge. We just refuse to see. In fact, you know, someone did a study on divorce and they came up with the four predictors of divorce. Basically means if you have these four habits in your marriage, chances are you will end up in divorce. And the four predictors of divorce is number one. It's criticism. You know, we're always talking to each other, complaining. You're always saying negative things to each other. Someone says something nice to you, you turn back and say something negative to the person. It's always criticizing. Number two is defensiveness. You are not allowing your spouse the right to say anything about your life. You want to say anything, you want to discuss anything, you are defensive. Third, contempt, unforgiveness. You have so much resentment built up and you just kept it in you and it comes out in so many other ways but you just let the resentment continue to grow. Fourth, is stonewalling. Don't talk about me. Denial, just shutting the door. Just refuse any conversation about anything. You just completely stonewall the whole situation. Now, two out of these four predictors is because of an uncorrectable heart. But the fourth one, the stonewalling, the denial, is the worst. Because we are just denying. We just stonewall the whole thing. And sometimes we deny not because we want to cover our sins, but just because we think too highly of ourselves. We just think that we are just so great, that it's, it's, I'm, I'm just so perfect, I'm just so great, it's not, 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 nothing to do with me. It can't be me. And we just 
can't see it. And we look at other people around and say, you know, these are the people, they're not spiritual enough, they're not mature enough. It's not my fault and we just can't see it. And, there's, and it's worse because there's no room for the Holy Spirit to work until you reach the final symptom. When you continue being defensive, you continue in blame transfer, and you continue in denial, the last thing hopefully it wakes you up is, would you write the last fourth point, is chronic failure. Chronic failure. Not because you failed once. All of us fail once. All of us will sin one time, we'll make a mistake. All of us will do that. But when we persist in an area that we are uncorrectable, you will have a chronic failure in that area. That you will find in your life, that area will f- flare out over and over and over again. You're going to end, your, end up in different places, different situations, but the same problem over and over and over again. You'll see that you always have the same problem with the same type of people, with the same issues over and over again. And this morning, friends, I, tell, I, 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 I plead with you. If you see your life today, if you look at your life today and you realize that there are areas in your life that you are going in circles, there are areas in your life you seem to be repeating itself. After a few years, it repeats itself. After a few months, it repeats itself. After a few days, it repeats itself. Friends, if you see that areas in your life, please pause and please take heed. There is something that God is trying to tell you. There's something that the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you about your life, that you have been denying all this while, that you have been transferring blame all this while, that you have been so defensive about. There's something that the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you. Please open your eyes so, so that you can have a correctable heart. We need a heart that's able to receive God's correction. Because you see, God doesn't condemn, but God convicts. You know the difference between condemnation and conviction is basically this. It's the same words, it's the same things about your life that God is speaking to, that it is being made known, but condemnation draws us further away from God. Conviction draws us closer to God. And that's why Proverbs 3, 12 says, for whom the Lord loves, He corrects. But you see, friends, but when conviction meets pride, it produces anger and defensiveness. But when conviction meets humility, it brings a correctable heart. When conviction meets pride, it produces anger, defensiveness, blame transfer. But when conviction meets humility, it brings a correctable heart and and repentance and transformation. And so you can write the next point of your notes is this, that the root cause is pride. The root cause is pride. The main thing that prevents our hearts to be correctable is pride. And that's, and, and that's, that's Satan's strategy. You see, before you became a Christian, before you became, come into Christ, Satan's strategy is to condemn you. You are worthless. You are useless. You are not good enough for God. God will never love you. God don't care about you. The world hates you. That is what Satan's strategy is. But when you become part of the family, when you enter into Christ and when you come into the family, Satan's strategy is now different. Satan's strategy is, oh, you are so good. You are so holy. God loves you so much. Just continue the way you are because God loves you so much. You see, Satan changes strategy. And when you are now in the family, the strategy is simple. The strategy is make you think so great about yourself, think that you are so loved by God, you are so holy, you are so righteous that you don't even see how uncorrectable we have become. And so friends, you know, we, the root of it is pride. And Satan has been using pride all this while. And that's why the Bible, you know, you know there's this English saying that says, the eye cannot see the eye. You all know the saying, right? The eye cannot see the eye. Are you trying to see your own eye? Can or not? Can you see your own eye? Even if you try to cross your two eyes together, can you see the other eye? The eye cannot see the eye. And many times, it's what pride does. Pride is like that. We just can't see our own eye. We can't see ourselves. We can't see the things in our lives that we need to deal with. Even when it's pointed out to us, we can't see it and we get angry, we get defensive, we blame, we blame it away, we tr- deny it. Because the eye can never see the eye because of the pride in us. So what's the cure? Would you write the, point, the next point? You know, the cure is to make godly commitments. Godly commitments. You see, we live in a society today that don't like commitments. 
For somehow, you know, we, it's a lie of the enemy that we say if we make a commitment, then now we are bound by it, we are tied down to it. And that's why in the West, especially today, young people, they don't like to get married. They say, why must I do a commitment, go to church, make a vow, make a covenant? No need commitment. Just live together, have children, have a family. We have freedom. But do you know something that commitment actually, uh, of course, godly ones, actually keep us secure. Because you see, when I make a commitment to my wife that I will love her until the day I die, and that's a commitment. And because the commitment is there, whether I feel like it, when there were days when I just feel so frustrated, when there are times that I just want to give up, there are days when my emotions are just so angry and frustrated, the commitment is what that holds me down. Why? Because I made a commitment. I made a commitment. Same thing in our faith. When we made a commitment, even though there's a pressures in the world, even there's a temptations in the world, and there are things trying to pull us away from God, no, nope. because a commitment has been made. It holds us. And sometimes we think that co making commitments bind us, control us. No, it actually frees us. When if we make a commitment, it frees us from all the distractions. It frees us from all the nitty gritties, all the things that we need to over. It frees us. Because when I make a commitment to God that every day, this is the time I will be here to be with God. That even though it's going to cost me a bit of money, it doesn't matter because that's the commitment I've made. Even if it's going to affect a bit of my business, it doesn't matter because that's the commitment I've made. Even if it's going to affect my TV show, it doesn't matter, this is the commitment I've made. It frees me from all the other things that will distract me because that's the commitment that I've made. And we need to make commitments. But not just any commitments, godly commitments. Godly commitments. Because when you make godly commitments, it frees you from the distractions and keeps you focused. And so what are the godly commitments we need to make so that we can have a correctable heart? A heart that can deal with our pride so that we can have a correctable heart. Would you write with me on those two commitments that we need to make? Number one is a daily heart check. Begin with a daily heart check. Second Corinthians says this, 13, 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. You see, friends, we need to examine ourselves daily. Daily. You know, you see, sometimes we, we just we just sometimes we like to just read the Bible and do a bit of examination once in five years. It doesn't help. It doesn't help, you know. Because you see, you know what I mean? You know my dad, my dad he passed away a couple of years back. You know, he had this, he, he you know, he was about, I don't know, I think after about 60 plus or above I you know, he he you know, and all of you old people here, when you cross 60 or 50, you have to go for blood sugar test, la, cholesterol test, la, high blood pressure test, every what? Three months, ah, every six months, ah, something like that, right? You know, and my dad, everything it was every six months he has to go for all these tests. And this is what he does. For five months, he will eat like nobody's business. He will enjoy his life. And the one month before the blood test, he will say, okay, that's the time he will eat all the oats, he will fast, he will do everything very quiet for that one month. Go for blood test, poop, results so good. The next five months, enjoy his life. Why? Because the blood test is only once every six months. And he got away with it. By the way, he didn't die because of diabetes or cholesterol or heart attack. <laughs> All right? But you see, but when we do a daily heart check, a daily check, it affects us. Because every day, I made a commitment to God that I'm going to come before the Holy Spirit every day. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit speak into my life. And I may not like it at first. I may resist what the Holy Spirit say. I will come and the Holy Spirit will say, I got a problem with anger. I don't care. Okay, forget it. I ignore. But tomorrow when I come back again, the Holy Spirit says again, I got a problem with anger. Okay, I ignore. When I come back again, you try to do that for six months, you think you are going to ignore. You try doing that for one year. And every day the Holy Spirit is saying, this is an area of your life you need to deal with. This is an area you need to correct. You think it's going to make a difference? It will. And that's why we need a daily heart check. We need to come to the Holy Spirit daily. And that's why the Bible tells us in Psalms 91, 3, say, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me. And Psalms 51 says, Create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. But isn't good enough, you know, we know the God standard already, ma. After all, we have been Christians for so long, we know how to be a good Christian, word. 
Why do I need a daily heart check? Well, because you need to make sure your standards are right with God. I mean, we all have different standards, right? I mean, example, I will ask my children to clean the house. There's a standard. And when my wife cleans the house, it's a different standard. Right? Because we all have different standards. Same thing with God. You know, in our life, God, when we live, try to live our lives without the daily heart check, we fall to our own standards of life. But when we come to God daily, when we come to the Word of God daily in our quiet times, not just a, not just a casual reading of the Bible, when we come to the Word of Lord lay daily and let the Holy Spirit speak through our lives, to our lives, through the Word of God, there's a daily heart check going on. But it's not enough. That's not enough. There's a second commitment that we make to need to make. Because when we have an uncorrectable heart, we will push back whatever the Holy Spirit says, or we can even twist the Word of God in such a way that we'll never see what we want to see. And that brings us to the second thing that we need. The second godly commitment that we need to make is to, have, to be accountable. To have people in your life that you are accountable to. You know, friends, we need, you know, as I said, the eyeball, you cannot see your eye, cannot see the eye. You can't see your own eye. But everybody else in the world can see your eye. You need people in your life that can speak into your life. You need to have people in your life that you will be accountable to. The classic example is that of David. You know, David, he was a man, the Bible says, a man after God's own heart. Was he a sinner? Yes. Was he a murderer? Yes. Was he a rapist? Yes. Was he a scoundrel? Yes. He was everything above and worse than Judah. But like Judah, he had a correctable heart. He had a heart that when he was confronted with sin, it was correctable. The classic story was David and Bathsheba. You know the story, right? David went, saw a girl, fell, uh, took the girl to his home, got the girl pregnant. Then Ayo, the husband, is going to come now. What's he going to do? He murdered the husband. Right? You know the classic story. And what happened after that? In 2 Samuel 12, then the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and he said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich, other poor. The rich man had actually many flocks, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children, and it, and it, ate, uh, and it ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveller came to the rich man who refused to take it from his flock and his herd and to pre uh, and prepare one for the wearing man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Dathan, As the Lord leaves, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. You see, David did all those things that he did with Bathsheba. He couldn't see there was anything wrong with it. He couldn't see the sin that he was committing until Nathan came and said, you are the one. Don't forget, David was the one who wrote the Psalms, Lord, search me, O God. David was the one that comes to God in Psalms in the temple praying daily, Lord, please check, check my heart. But he still couldn't see it until a Nathan came along to point out to David, there's something wrong. You've done something wrong. We need Nathans in our lives. We need people in our lives whom we will be accountable to. Do you have such people in your life? If not, friends, may I encourage you to go and get them right now. Be, make a commitment. I don't mean that you go and see somebody and say, okay, brother, uh, you know, from now on, uh, you, are, you, are, you are my accountable, you are going to be responsible, uh, everything, please come and point out to me. I don't mean that. But what I mean is this that you will identify individuals in your life, people in your life whom you will give the authority in your own mind. You don't even have to tell that person. That you give him the authority to speak into your life. That whenever these people say something about your life, you will listen. You will take heed. Hey, there must be something that, I'm, that is my blind side I couldn't see. That I will heed whatever that person says. Because that person is now someone that I've placed as a watchman over my life. And please, friends, find someone who loves God, who is close to God. Otherwise, whatever he says about your life is not about God, but about his own uh, prejudice about your life. Find someone who is close to God and someone who is close to you as well. Don't go and let, get, get strangers from nowhere because they don't know what's your life inside and out. But the people who know you and people who know God 
But more importantly, listen, listen, carefully, listen carefully, friend. They must be people who loves God and loves you and in that order. He loves God first more than he loves you. Look for such people in your life. Have Nathans in your life. So that whenever something comes up in your life that needs correction, when they speak into your life, you have made a commitment, I will hear. That when even though I don't like it, even though I think he's wrong, even though I despise everything he just said, I made a commitment, I will listen. I will listen. There's this story about this two friends and they decided to become accountability partners one day it's supposed to be a true story i don't know His name, their name was paul and william and they became they were in church and they, they want to become godly men so they said let's be accountable to each other and they decided to do that and one day when uh they were uh paul was talking to william and paul said you know i really struggle with profanity I always sometimes just will blurt out something and curse someone and say all those four-letter words. Then William said, okay, we are accountable. Let's watch each other. Every time you say that, you put $10 into the offering bag. You say, okay, no problem. So the first week, they come to church, how much must you put? Oh, I have to put 100 ringgit because I curse 10 times. But somehow, maybe Paul, quite a rich fella, la, 100 ringgit never stopped him. Next week, come back again, 150 the following week, 200. The next week, 300. Rich guy, no problem. Then William said, okay, 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 I think we need to change strategy here. Next week you come, you tell me how, much, how many times you curse. But it's not, you don't have to put anything in the offering bag anymore. So next week he came. How many times you curse? Oh, I curse 15 times today. Then this is what William did, okay? You curse 15 times. He took 150 and put it in the offering bag. Paul said, hey, what are you doing? No, no. That is the accountability partner. Next week, Paul came back again. How many times you curse? Eight times this time. And William put $80 into the offering bag. Next week, Paul came again. How many times you curse? 80 again. William put another 80 in the offering bag. There was no fourth week anymore. Because Paul could not stand seeing someone else pay for his sins. And that's what accountability partners do, friends. When we have people to walk with us, to deal with the areas of our lives that need correction, and we need it because we just can't see things on our own. We need people who would correct us. At the end of the Judas life, everyone makes mistakes, but how correctable are you? At the end of Judah's life, God was able to redeem it all. Like I said, Judah became the inheritor of Abraham's covenant because of his correctable heart. But if you go back to the, gene the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, remember I told you, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perah by Tamar. You see, Jesus came out of this line of an ancestral relationship, whatever you want to call it, out of this sin that Jesus came out from the son that Judah bore through Tamar. But despite that, God was able to redeem that sin. Likewise, friends, in your life, it doesn't matter how deep you are in that uncorrectable area in your life. It doesn't matter how entrenched it has been in your life. It doesn't matter how destructive it has been in your life. But when you are willing to be correctable, when you are willing to be corrected, God can redeem even that mistakes, even that sins, even the fruits of that, God is able to redeem. But only only if we are correctable. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And this morning, once again, we ask for you to speak to us, Lord. As we prepare ourselves to come to the communion table later, Lord. Lord, may you just search our hearts this morning. 
and show us the areas in our lives that we are uncorrectable. The areas in our life where we just refuse to listen to correction and we just refuse to do anything about it. And Lord, because there are such many areas in our life that we just can't see, Lord, would you just raise up Nathans in our midst right now? Not Nathans who choose themselves to be Nathans for us, no. But people in our lives whom we will appoint as Nathans in our lives. People whom we will be accountable to. Our spiritual elders, our pastors, our small group leaders. People in our lives whom we will choose to be accountable to, Lord. Lord, I just commit all of us unto your hands. Even as we partake of communion later, you reveal these people in our lives that we need to make them accountable, to, to be accountable with. Lord, I just commit all of us unto your hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.